All right, back with us on Tennis Channel Inside In. It's uh, been a minute, but we always like to catch up with Pam Shriver, a tennis hall famer, esteemed broadcaster, and I think noted Halloween fan as well as we record this. <laughs> of course, you have to be a Halloween fan. I'm kind of glad my kids are totally in charge of their own Halloween planning because that was a stressful night through the years. Yeah, you've gotten to the point, right, where they're a little older than the, than the trick-or-treat yeah. ages. I've got and three freshmen in college. They're all three started their freshman year. Wow. Two months. Yeah, it was always a fun time of year. Now, yeah, the older we get, it's like, oh, costume parties are back in the rage. There's like an era where you don't dress up, and now we're all into it. I think they used to have people dressing up around Tennis Channel, but I don't know if it got too provocative or whatever, but, you know, we still celebrate it here. Uh, it is good to see you, Pam, and, uh, you know, this time of year especially, and you're just coming off of the road, working with Donna Vekic, which I want to get to, but the Asian swing back, and it wasn't the longest stay, but you got to go over there, experience tennis in Asia, and work with another player that's playing well, so what was that experience like for you? Well, it was interesting. When I, when I left uh, L.A., the plan was I would be with Donna for three straight weeks in Asia, starting with Wuhan and then Ningbao and Tokyo, and I checked with her the day before I left because, listen, even though L.A. is closer to get to uh, Wuhan than, say, if you're leaving from New York or Florida, you know, it was complicated. And I wanted to make sure I wanted to hear her voice, and she sounded good, and she told me four things she wanted me to bring down, so off I went. And then by the time I got there, and I, anyone who's on Donna's team that can get this is at the end of a year, especially when you've, had, you've played your best tennis, you can hit the wall. Uh -huh. quickly and Wuhan evidently was the end of the road for Donna's year um, she had some things that she'd been managing physically so I ended up just having basically like a long weekend in Wuhan <laughs> <laughs> and I'd played in China 30 years ago yeah over 30 years ago first time ever a WTA tour event was in China it was in Beijing a pretty small one so it was first time in 30 years I was back yeah it um it's good to have tennis in that part of the season there. I totally get that though, especially when you've, as you said, played your best tennis, gone some deep runs, and in her case, because that Wimbledon run was special, getting to the semis. I know it didn't end in a fairy tale fashion, but a successful run, also a very physical run. Some of those matches took literally like days to play. So it was a, a long and I'm sure satisfying year when you look back at it now with that week to process. Well, it was. It's one of the things I feel like I've brought to Donna's team is um, knowing I can just remember so much the later part of my career, say after I'd been on tour for 12, 13, 14 years, right. kind of think about some things that I, I wish I had done better to make being on the tour in those you know, veteran stages more enjoyable. And um, that's something that I've really encouraged is to, okay, you've got to work hard, but if you don't bring joy, it's a stressful job. And um, Donna's done a great job. Mm -hmm. And she went off a very disappointing clay court season where I didn't realize I was remote. I was just helping her through the clay court season where I could from LA. I didn't realize how down she had gotten. Mm. And then she needed the grass courts under her feet to get the renewal. Yeah. And then, boy. And then back to the clay for the Olympics. And then the Olympics was interesting because I went to, for a training block week last early December in Monte Carlo. First time I'd ever been to that great tennis city. And she said out loud to her team that one of her three main goals was to win an Olympic medal. And halfway through the Olympic Games to realize that she felt her best bet was in the singles. Even though it was on clay, her worst surface. She felt she was playing well. She had um, shown great resilience to have the uh -huh. difficulty of the Paolini loss, you know, 10-8 in the match, tie break, two points away from a Wimbledon final, and be able to regroup and play as well as she performed mm -hmm. um, was amazing. It did make her tired <laughs> for the hardcore season. It made me tired watching that Kostuk match. Oh. We were here, and it was, like, going late. I was like, what time is it? It's getting darker here, but they're still playing, and passionate though it was interesting because i actually could do some scouting because that was uh she won that match in the match tiebreak yeah. again and then was playing schmidlova in the semis uh -huh. you know to guarantee herself a medal and team vekic we didn't know a lot about schmidlova but it was two in, it was two yeah. in the morning by the time they got out of <laughs> roland garros after yeah. the kostyuk win so I did some scouting on Shmi Logan. Yeah, they can, like, rest, and you yeah. got the time. And to, then yeah. I was still awake. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So it was interesting how yeah. the team works no matter where you are. Special stuff. It also goes without saying. This happens a lot with tennis because players burst on the scene young, but, you know, still just 28 is very young considering how long she's been around. And 
Well, there's some 28 year olds that have really, <laughs> uh, Pal- when you think about Paulini's yeah, year this yeah. year at 28, and I think people notice that. Um, people notice, like, okay, wow, Krajcikova just won her second major, and she's about the same age, 28. Um, so I think Donna realizes the pr- she's in the prime of her career, even though she's got some wear and tear mm-hmm. she has to manage. Um, and I, I really look forward to the third year. We just passed our second second anniversary and ready to go because she's at a career high, which is fun. It's fun. It's exciting to see. Uh, could be uh, an entry in, in next year's WTA finals. This year's is about to start in a few days as we record this. So gang's all here. It's good to see. You know, we'll get to the field in just a second. But for these events, especially the bigger ones, obviously the majors, but the finals, it's good to see the arrival, the practice footage, and everybody, you know, putting the work in before. It does kind of have a big you say big fight feel or big match, big tournament feel when you see that. Yeah, it's had a tough few years, right? This WTA Tour (laughs) final, talking about China, it was supposed to have a home there before everything that happened there starting five years ago. Um, So it's good to see, even though it's at a controversial place, it's good to see that there's a plan, a Mm long-term plan, um, that the money is what you want and the players have known for quite a while where they're going to play. And there's some really interesting storylines. There always is top eight on the year, but there's been some interesting coaching changes mm-hmm. late in the year. Um, some real curiosity for how players like Rebakana, first time playing since you know she yeah, withdrew at the Open. You could say that there's a lot maybe to play for to prove in in different ways. Whether it's where you're ranked, where you want to be, maintaining stuff, what you look like when you get back, and as you know, setting yourself up for next season too. It's really interesting because usually the championships is it's the culmination of the year, right? But there's mm-hmm. actually some new beginnings going mm-hmm. on. Whether it's uh, Iga Svantec's new partnership with yeah. him, whether it's how Rybakina is going to um, renew, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and then and then the WTA. It's nice. I know there's some team competitions and stuff, but I, I'm glad that the women start their off season sooner than the guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, I did want to mention, too, I know the format's changed since your playing days, but you're very familiar with this tournament. Yourself and Martino winning the doubles 10 times. Uh, a ten. good, A good a good <laughs> stat to know. She has a few more than you, though, because she won it a yes. couple other times. Uh, Martina just racking up awards. But you also had made the uh, 88 finals, and I looked that up because you had an impressive win over Steffi Graf to get there, and that was her year. So Yeah, it, know, was, it was interesting <laughs> in 88 because I beat Chrissy in the quarters. Yeah. And this is this was sort of the story of my career. I beat Chrissy in a quarter, Groff in the semis. So that's beating an 18-time major mm-hmm. winner. And and that was when we actually started in round of 16. I think I beat a German Sylvia Hanukkah lefty first round. And then I ran into Sabatini, who I think had upset Martina. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it just was too much for me to get those wins after wins after wins. Um, but almost got there. It's, it shows a lot. And I remember you. The, one of the first times you were on this show, you blew a lot of people's minds saying you made, what was it, 10 major semis and it was a Hall of Famer like every single time. Yeah, I think the player <laughs> that I uh, played in a semi that had the least amount of major wins was Hanna Monlikova. But yeah, they were all <laughs> Hall of Famers. player too. All Hall of Famers. Yeah, and at that point though, it kind of highlights, I know things have changed, but you're in this tournament, there's no easy matches. Like you're playing the best. They, these And the fact that it's the race, not quite the rankings, they've earned the right by their play to get here. Well, and, and just like in my year when we used to qualify, it does reward usually, especially the tail end of, say, mm-hmm. six, seven, eight, if you play a lot. And I do think the tour, mm-hmm. you know, they need to figure out the incentives that make players want to play more. Yeah. And I've been really impressed because I started the Asian swing in Wuhan. That was my start. Mm-hmm. And I'm still seeing players still over there in Hong yeah. Kong uh, <laughs> yeah. wrapping things up. Mentioned a few of them. And before we get to the groups, I, I think that it's good. I've t- I talked to Coco Vandeway about this. We were in agreement. But if you disagree, you can go right ahead. I like the Barbara Kirchikova getting here, being a top 20 player with the Grand Slam. I think it's a nice rule, but there could be dissenting opinions on that. I don't really have a strong <laughs> opinion on that. I feel like if you want to make sure you get into the WTA Tour Final, then you better make sure you finish... <laughs> higher than eight, <laughs> yeah, finish, yeah. Grab, grab five, six, or seven, if not higher. Um, I think if you win a major, it's certainly, um, it's unusual. Usually in women's tennis, if you win a major, you qualify. Obviously, someone like Rada Kanu a couple of years ago. There's been more exceptions on the women's yeah. side. Well, looking at the groups now, the purple and the orange group for the final. So that's, you know, we're going to name them after legends, I think, eventually, maybe year two or three. 
Uh, but just some initial thoughts on where the groups are, and we can talk about these players, Pam. But the purple group is Sabalenka, Jasmine Paulini, Rabakina, and Chinwen Zhang, the gold medalist this year. Orange is Iga, the two Americans, Coco Gauff, Jesse Pagula, and Barbora Kruchikova. So I hate to I hate to do this where we're like, what group's stronger, what's tougher, because you don't know these are all great players. But what jumps out at you as I say those initial names? I think any group right now with Sabalenka in it mm. kind of catches my eye first based on her play the last few months, how she's grabbed back the number one ranking. I think that's also kind of an interesting storyline here is you've got Ego who's held the number one most of the last three years against the one who's been able to nudge in there briefly <laughs> a year ago. And then now with a little more momentum, it looks like Sabalenka might create some distance. And I think that's going to be really interesting going into Australia is to see who feels like, is Sabalenka going to be a dominant number one? And the other thing is, I think how much um, Kinwen Zhang has, has improved since she played that Australian Open right. final beginning of the year with just living with a big moment. And obviously being from China, winning the gold medal, uh, doing well at the Open, but I think she was really hurt by actually beating Donna and finishing at 2.15 in the morning. The round of 16, she had nothing a day and a half yeah. later against Sabalenka. And you can see their score lines are tight. So that was like, that was a direct result. Result, you can't yeah. finish in the middle of the night if you've never done it before. <laughs> did you, and I guess you can speak to this if it's just something fans think or if it's real, but did you ever have a moment coming up where like Chin Wen maybe in, in the Sabalenka match, okay, this is, we're a level up now. This is a new thing I need to chase to. Because it's it seems like she had that match in Australia got outclassed, for lack of a better term, but has improved so much, it was almost like it was the real learning experience. Is that something that happens when you reach the top you know, level of the game? Absolutely. It's, it's very few players that um, have that first major breakthrough and then just, um, you know, it's, it's usually a progression, and I, I do feel like her progression, mm -hmm. I mean, we think a few years ago, remember she took a set against Iga at Roland Garros, and people like had an eye on her. She was the most promising young Asian yeah. player, especially Chinese player. Yeah. And you think about her step-by-step -step progression. I also think Per Reba was a great um, coaching matchup that she was reunited with. I think he's turning into quite the coach. When mm -hmm. you think about what he did with Coco, what happened with Coco once he left, mm -hmm. and what he's doing now. So it seems, and I got to know in, in Wuhan, it was really interesting because I was only there for four days. But like I spoke to Ken Wen's, um fitness trainer from mm -hmm. Canada. I can't remember her first name, but like she's got a really good team around her and yeah. that's kind of what you look for. Yeah, I think you were there too in San Diego a few years ago when she played Iga and that was a match where I believe she took a set also. It was, so she's a competitor and you need to be that way and you need to learn and, and adjust. And you know what? She doesn't get intimidated and, <laughs> no, and while she's no. gotten, a, a, you know, some players a little ticked off at the way she maybe conducts herself and some little subtleties, I feel like she definitely stands out with how she yeah. carries herself as a future champion. Well, you have to, right? Like you have to, you know, carry yourself a certain way and not be intimidated at this level. But Sabalenka, I mean, it, I was looking at the numbers. She's 54 and 12 on the year, 38 and 7 on hard courts with the two majors. If she puts a feather in her cap, it is a truly transcendent season. But you know, we talk about the improved mentality, which is deservedly so. But in watching her in highlights from years ago, I, I also marvel at she looks fitter. She looks like she's in the peak of her athletic shape as well. Honestly, uh, the whole fitness side of things, <laughs> yeah. and I've seen that from Donna's standpoint, is when she really leans into her off-court training and keeps herself disciplined between, you know, during mm -hmm. her breaks. And I feel like uh, Sabalenka lives the lifestyle, kind of like the way Novak Djokovic has mm -hmm. been the role model for, you know, you don't feel like you're sacrificing what he was sacrificing if this is the lifestyle and the wellness um, angle that you want to live. And I feel like Sabalenka has matured into everything that you say, a, a complete <laughs> tennis player and extremely fit and strong one. Seems like the second time, not all, all the case, but for these great hall of fame level players, when they get to number one, maybe the, the second time when they can, you know, take their shoes off and enjoy themselves. That's when it's like a different, when they literally are the hunted. The first time she got there, it was a battle. Iga reclaimed it not shortly thereafter, but now it's unquestioned. She's the best player in the world. We think what she's gone through in her young life. I mean, she mm -hmm. lost her dad pretty early. Mm -hmm. um, she obviously was rocked this year with what happened in Miami with her ex-boyfriend taking his life. Even what she went through on the court with what I consider the worst ever case of the yips and how she was able to persevere through that, you know, not take 
um, excessive action within her team. She brought in somebody new. Mm -hmm. I think his name is Kevin, Mm -hmm. um, the biomechanics guy. And, you know, she's just been very thoughtful about how she's done it. And when you look at her attributes, again, going on the strength and the size and the power, I mean, you think about what Serena did through those years. And Sabalenka, she can get this serve and have it be the way it's been. Mm -hmm. I mean, her power is... Maybe there's two or three that can get close when they're on, but it really separates her. She doesn't have to go as big because she hits it that hard, if that makes sense, right? She doesn't have to paint lines because the power and the pace is just crazy. And I feel like that's one of the things she yeah. realizes is that she can hit the ball four <laughs> feet inside. Yeah. And maybe it'll take two more balls to yeah. hit the winner, but it's better than having yeah. more unforced errors. Well, Iga, you mentioned her. She's going to be playing in this tournament. She's going to be playing with Wim Fassett, the new coaching partnership. There's been... Much made about that, her game. A successful year by all metrics, except maybe the standard she holds herself to. Still one role in Garo, still made deep runs in a lot of tournaments, but a new role for her, a new opportunity for her. What should we expect from Iga in this tournament? What are you looking to see that maybe she's kind of added to her game? Yeah, well, I, I feel like a lot of times players, when they add a new voice, they get a real bump in their game. There's that honeymoon period. So, you know, if I would, and I, I actually feel to start as a coach in a tournament where you know your player is going to have at least three matches, and if they get through to the semis um, and finals even more, I think it's a great start for Wim to see her play three straight matches against other, you know, top 10 players. Um, I want to see Iga's anxiety level. I do I do think being a head coach these days of these big-time players, there has to be part of you that buys into the mindset. Mm-hmm. And while I know Iga has someone in charge of mindset, I think that's gotten very complicated for mm-hmm. Iga. And I, I, I think Wim has the respect and the experience. Um, I expect him to help make a difference with how she maybe um, processes the anxiety that she feels on the court. Right. I think it's... Fair to say that there were matches last year, some high-profile ones, where she unraveled a little bit. And there could be differing reasons for that. It could be the person on the other side of the net a lot of times, too. But he is respected. He's done a lot of great work with great players. He's probably what she needs right now. But that doesn't guarantee that it's going to be good. And you mentioned, too, that, like, three matches guaranteed. What a odd thing for a tennis tournament in this round-robin format. Yeah, and they got there early. I mean, we were sort of tracking... Um, <laughs> I think it's going to play well for Iga at the start of the year that she didn't overplay um, yeah. at the end of 2024. So, you know, I think Iga's going to come back pretty strong. Mm-hmm. Um, we see her athleticism, her movement, her strength, and mm-hmm. she's willing to work on with tweaking of the serve. So um, I think she's going to have a good 2025. But now she's got <laughs> somebody well and truly that also believes yeah. they can be number one in the world. More with Pam Shriver on Tennis Channel Inside, and we're talking WTA Finals, other storylines and storylines in the game, and uh, one of those players that deserves just tremendous respect. She got to number four in the world, but Jasmine Paulini, the season she had, where she's come from, and the only player that's going to be in the doubles as well with Sarah Arani at this event. So for Paulini to be here to be number four, just a remarkable, just really a remarkable way to overachieve and really just, you know, increase your potential. What she did all year, how she takes a professional approach to each tournament has just been stunning. Yeah, it all started in February when she won the tournament in the Middle East, um, and it really flipped her whole career around. But one thing I think is very noticeable is talk about, we talked earlier Mm -hmm. in the pod about playing with joy, feeling joy. When you see Paulini play, even when she's losing a match, she actually has an air of joy and, mm-hmm. and love about competing and playing and striking a tennis ball. And that's why she's become a crowd favorite worldwide. Mm-hmm. I, w- I was walking past Louis Armstrong, um, and I wasn't sure who was playing, uh, but it was a first match on. Armstrong erupted, and I thought it yeah. was only like noon, and I'm like, well, it's not like it's deep in a final set yet. It turns out it was Paulini on match <laughs> point. But it was a U.S. Yeah. crowd, and I yeah. thought it was for sure a U.S. player. It wasn't. Yeah. It was Paulini. And Donna, when she finished losing the semi, Donna was devastated. And one of the questions Donna asked me was, why was the crowd so much for Paulini? And I, I kind of want to say, well, they're attracted yeah. to just her joy yeah. and the way she bounces around the court. Yeah, I can speak for my family. My sister loves her, and just seeing her, we saw her play at Indian Wells. She won a tough match. I think it was against Kalinskaya. And yeah, there's just there's just an innocence and a joy to how she plays and a positivity that, that I think a lot of players are kind of envious of that they can just that she can stay positive and upbeat. And it's infectious yeah. and, it, and it, it it can influence, yeah, everyone who's watching. 
U.S. Open, at that point in the year, she had the most tour wins. I'm not sure if that's still the case, but yeah, that's remarkable. And then maybe the doubles helping her out, too, playing with Sarah Rani, winning a gold medal. Yeah, I think Paulini's tailed off a little bit the last couple mm -hmm. of months. There's that fatigue factor. It'll be interesting to see how she follows up by far her greatest ever year. I do think she's another example of how doubles help set the table for you to think mm -hmm. bigger in singles. There's so many players that you can say that about, whether it's Krajcikova, um, players that pass like Azarenko did well in doubles before uh, Ash Barty you know, started <laughs> winning doubles yeah. majors before singles majors. Um, and it's an interesting thing for doubles to hang on right now because it's, it's fighting for its relevancy right now. So how would you assess where and how the Americans are heading into this? In the same in the same region, Coco yes. and Pagula, so. Well, wow, what two <laughs> interesting years. Uh, Pagula, first part, you were like, whoa, has she kind of hit, hit, uh, hit the wall given her last four or five years and how well, and she had the big coaching change. And the round hit, number of 30, that's yes, the other thing to think yeah, about. Yeah, hit 30, but um, wow, to see how she responded after getting through the injuries, um, got on her favorite hard courts, I thought it was tremendous, uh, the double marks, coaching Merklin and Knowles, um, and to see the payoff. I mean, for Pagula to have lost so many painful quarterfinals and then to get over the top against Iga the way she did, nighttime, U.S. Open, to win her first mm -hmm. quarter against the, um, I think uh, Iga was still number one at that time, yeah. and then go f uh, further against when she beat Muhova, when Muhova started a semi about as quickly <laughs> as you can start. It was really impressive how how... Pagula believed, and I thought the final, it was one of my favorite straight set finals that I'd seen, right? Yeah. Five and five, yeah. but it was so full that was of Sab intrigue. That was Sabalenka in the uh, semifinal, right, against Navarro. Same thing, straight set match, but looked a lot more competitive than that, given the best shot she was taking. So. Yeah, and you bring up Navarro. She's the other one that you just wonder, like, can she continue the growth and continue up the rankings, or when is she going to have a little... I don't want to say a ranking correction, but I, you know, I, she very well could be here next year. And she almost was this year. It was very close to the end. So, um, no, it's Pagula's year is interesting. And, and Coco golf again, like makes the coaching change wins a premier event. And then the very next event has more service. woes. so for her and I, and I'm not saying this, you know, begrudgingly at all. It seems like it is tournament to tournament. Sometimes her floor is very high and she can beat just about anyone in any given match. But there are still some consistency factors, especially with that serve. Maybe the forehand as well, Pam, but tournament to tournament, you're getting a different version of her. Yeah, it was interesting. Uh, one of the people I met down in Wuhan uh, was Matt Daly, her new coach. Um, and I'd heard about him before, I think when he was maybe at Shapovalov, but he's certainly not well known. <laughs> but I was really impressed by my conversation with him. And, you know, there's another example of a new voice, and she immediately went on that nice little run. Obviously, the serve left her in that final against Sabalenka. 21 double faults is an extraordinary high number, but what I liked is it didn't seem to bleed to the rest of her game. Like, her forehand stood up pretty well in that match, mm -hmm. and she was toe-to-toe -to -toe from the ground. Yeah. And, you know, obviously, you know, having a second serve that you can rely on is, is such an important part of the game. So that'll be, I would think, an off-season really roll the sleeve up for that team to figure out how to get her a more bankable second serve so she doesn't feel the stress. Because let me tell you what can happen. The stress on the serve very easily can bleed to stress on the forehand. Mm -hmm. Those two shots are very connected in the anxiety world. She's still putting together year after year of success, another top three finish, and a lot to like about her game. And still very young. But, yeah, it's going to be, you know, there's new challenges out there. Sabalenka has been at the top, and – if it wasn't for Coco Golf, Seb Link would have the last four hardcore majors. So there is that to consider too. And then, of course, we mentioned Erlena Rabakina being in this event. And I just, you know, there's stuff out there, and I know there's stuff we're not privy to as we shouldn't be, but hope she enjoys being out there. Hope she's doing all right. And I do hope that, you know, she finds joy and consistency in competing because the game, I don't want to say needs her, but is better when she's at the top contending. 100%. I mean, when you think since Serena's retirement, like what WTA tour players serve stands out the most? Mm -hmm. Henry Bacchina. And not only that, her two-handed backhand is world-class. The forehand is kind of the side that can be a bit. But my, oh my, I, I hope so. I hope she can reset with her team and at this point in her career and really have a positive 2025. And you're right. I want to see her smiling and enjoying mm -hmm. herself and enjoying her talents because mm -hmm. they're massive. 
Massive, massive. You said before, never thought you'd enjoy two power players until you saw Sabalenka and Rabak in a play. Uh, and then, of course, and, and, and we mentioned her too, but you know, rounding out the field, Barbora Kruchikova. I like her here not just because she won Wimbledon, but because she's a different style. I like just having new pieces, new ingredients in this, someone that plays a little differently. I loved how she responded to somebody on her social media when they said, how does how did Krejcikova get into uh, she, the WTA <laughs> yeah. Tour Finals? And yeah. she said, by winning seven, or how did she, I don't know, maybe it was how'd how she, she win Wimbledon, win Wimbledon yeah. by winning seven matches in a row. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, that was uh, as impressive. Two majors and singles, a gold, all those doubles majors. Well, I, I wanted to round this out with some other thoughts, too. And we mentioned doubles, Pam. You know, the finals are going to be here. But just kind of an open-ended question because you made your name and then some in doubles. But where are you at right now with where the doubles game is in the current day? I know they're trying some stuff. There's some singles players that are dedicating themselves to the game. Where do you think the game is currently? Well, it's very interesting to see doubles last couple of years because there's actually been incredibly high profile moments that doubles has brought whether it's how Federer chose uh, to have his last match it was doubles mm -hmm. at Labor Cup um, look at Murray the only mm -hmm. way he could really have an ending that was fitting or what he wanted once he realized he couldn't do it mm -hmm. in singles he really embraced the doubles at Wimbledon with his brother and then with Dan Evans at, at uh, the Olympics What's Rafa going to do? Is he really going to play singles at the Davis Cup? Or is he I just going to... I mean, I wouldn't think so. I wouldn't so, think so either. And, and look how he... I was so excited to play with Alcaraz at the Olympics. Um, so doubles means a lot to a lot of players. Now it's trying to figure out how the pro game can make it um, distinctive and set it aside. I do think doubles players could lean into how the sport has been trying to bring more innovation mm -hmm. and bring more fans inside baseball, inside tennis. Well, I feel like doubles players, you know, they don't have a lot to lose right now. The sport, mm -hmm. since the Bryan twins retired, has kind of fallen on some difficult times. So lean into fan engagement. Lean into, you know, problem solving yourself. Don't just, like, question, well, we don't have a good schedule. Help, you know, Eric Buderak at the USTA and Stacey Allister try to figure out a better home for right. doubles. How can we have the showcase of doubles because definitely late in majors you have programming that you still need and you have so mm -hmm. few singles matches mm -hmm. so you still need you know not yeah. just legends coming out but like doubles can still be so entertaining and most of the world that's still mostly what they play mm -hmm. at the recreation level you can try to commercialize it with new ideas and just make it a better spectator maybe not even spectator but just show for television for media for how you consume it i actually think and it's funny because there's a lot of debate pam about the two weeks of all these masters events now and how long they are but i was talking to mark knowles about this and yeah the second week maybe having more focus on doubles could be better you could have some single players play but yeah, i'm with you any way that you can make it more exciting you can try stuff out i kind of feel like some 250 events might want to be considering new innovations too but yeah experiment with stuff because you might strike gold well, I do think another thing people get really curious about in doubles is the tactics and the communication. And, you know, I, I can imagine like question and answers mm -hmm. after doubles that involves fans and people watching wanting to know, well, how can my USTA 3.5 partner and I <laughs> use the law better? How do we yeah. use the middle or the doubles alleys? Can you clue us in? I just think, yeah, it's not working right now, and I, but I still think doubles will always be an important part of our game. It's just trying to figure out its mm -hmm. home in 2025 and beyond. Also, at a moment, too, the Bryans getting into the Hall of Fame, part of the Maria Sharapova class, so another moment for doubles there. Uh, well, rounding this down, got two things out the door for Pam Shriver, one being, you know, we've seen some of these champions of the past on the women's game that are still trying to play maybe the end of this year or just find their footing for 2025. Names like Bianca Andreescu, Sophia Kennan, Naomi Osaka, who's getting back in the mix as well. If any of these or are there other players you think could have bigger years in 2025 to regain their footing? You know, I've thought so many times, say, using Andreescu as an example, who uh, 2019, that U.S. Open win over Serena was incredible. <laughs> and, you know, I've often thought, what if all the one slam major winners got their games physically, mentally together all at the same time. Because, like, Andrescu had such a following. Raducanu, so too. Everything. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. look, physically, and, and Andrescu and Raducanu, the, the physical nature of tennis right now, it, it's really hard. Like, I see what Donna 
tries to go through to keep her, <clears throat> manage her arm, her feet, you know, the body after years and years. And it's hard. Look what Del Potro couldn't do it. There's been, there's been a lot of players that just physically can't stand up to the demands. Um, I was asking a year ago, I was thinking Alcaraz may, I was like, whoa, he seems to get injured every couple of months. But they're figuring it out. Um, I, I I don't know. I'm not sure that Radicanu mm-hmm. and Rescue have the body to be able mm-hmm. to endure. Yeah. It's tough. The game seems to be getting more and more physical, and there's a lot of tournaments to play that you have to play, and that's a whole another set of circumstances. But players are, as you said, maybe being smarter with their schedule and their training. You have to be. Yeah. I mean, the game, when I think about when I started – in the tour as a 15 year old in 1978 the way the game was played and then each and every decade the power quotient picks up the string changes this mm-hmm. and the way they hit the ball the way they move sliding on hard courts <laughs> mm-hmm. the demands physically of what's out there how competitive matches aren't just happening from the round of 16 on they happen earlier in majors and that's why i think eventually in the men's game they're going to look at the three out of five set mm-hmm. model and say you know what it's not sustainable anymore mm-hmm. especially in a couple of majors where you get heat waves and mm-hmm. you know the, the extreme temperature things that are going on so it's gonna be interesting to see where the game goes in the next decade well, we're gonna be watching we just don't know where it's gonna go that's so the fun of it. that is the fun of it pam shriver last thing have to ask you because you know, you covered him for so long, but any Nadal memories or stories you want to say as he gets ready to retire? You know, I, to me, I think about how Rafa did the little things really well as a gentleman and a champion, whether it's, you know, sweep the clay court he's just finished to practice on and, or the way he thanks uh, people in the media room when he's finished with a tournament, the way he's treated ball kids and umpires and linesmen. You know, he, he just has a really great set of core values, and you put that with his talent, his work ethic, and the way he kind of uh, is, is resilient to the tough times. Nothing but admiration whenever I've interviewed him through the years, and I also really appreciate that he never minded his coaching box uh, to give insights in the middle of matches on set mm. breaks. I thought that's, you know, I thought that was really good. So for someone so traditional in many ways... He was okay to new things as well. Um, so tre- tremendous mm-hmm. respect. I just still can't believe that I've seen somebody win five more majors than the player I saw win nine Wimbledons, Martina, <laughs> that he was able to add five to a number of that I thought was already too high. Never want to say it'll never be broken or never say never, but I don't know. I don't know if <laughs> I'll ever see I think someone it's do. Safe to say. Someone do what Nadal did, but a testament to his character and a testament to your character, Pam Shriver, for coming on this show yet again. Always a pleasure. Always fun. Uh, making the long drive from Brentwood over here. So. Hey, yeah. And you know what? Podcasts have become <laughs> yeah. one of my favorite form of keeping up with the game, so um, I listen to you. Appreciate that, Pam Shriver. Thanks for coming on Inside In.